to upright music versus Warner Brothers. The rap artist Biz Marquis sampled the first eight bars of Gilbert O'Sullivan's Alone Again Naturally and looped it in the back of his song for his album, I Need a Haircut. And he may have realized that things were going to turn out badly for him when he read the first four words of the judge's decision, thou shalt not steal. The whole first sentence is, thou shalt not steal has been an admonition followed since the dawn of civilization. Suffice it to say that for the judge, sampling equaled theft. Now some musicians and artists in the audience may find this decision puzzling. When Charlie Parker quoted a phrase from My Funny Valentine, was that stealing? Isn't blues, folk, rock and roll, jazz built on a long tradition of borrowing, reworking, building upon you know, familiar musical themes and elements? In fact, the law in this area is much more complex than the judge in the Grand Upright case might suggest. There are a host of exceptions and limitations that copyright law draws to allow people to make various uses of music. In addition, regardless of what the law may be, the practices in the music industry may be very different. Artists and executives who work mainly in one genre may find entirely legitimate what artists and executives in another genre may demand payment for. In addition, there are also historical differences in the way that musicians in different genres perceive their rights, regardless of what those rights on the books may actually be. So how does the law, both on the books and in the minds of artists, shape our musical culture? Where is the line between borrowing creativity and, as the judge would have it, simple theft? On the one hand, artists want control of their works. They want to be able to be paid for their works. But on the other hand, they don't want the very practice of making music to be considered illegal. If Robert Johnson and Charlie Parker were aspiring musicians today, would their contributions be hailed as high art? Or would they be considered to be simple appropriation? These are going to be the subjects of our second panel this afternoon, Music Bound by Law. Within the uh, jazz tradition, we, we would call this, this whole discussion great composers steal because uh, Stravinsky, Igor Stravinsky, was known for a, 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 um, uh, a quote himself that said, good composers borrow and great composers steal. Um, and that is his way of saying it's very rare that you will find a piece that just exists in and of itself in a bubble. Instead, you're going to find that some of the music, like the Rite of Spring, which he wrote, was actually derived completely from folk tunes, from Russian folk tunes. So there's music that's already um, in existence that's pretty useful. Um, within jazz, there are the simple limitations of Western music that are going to, um, that are going to constrain us um, in terms of what we consider borrowing and what we consider new material. In a Western scale, we only have 12. 11 notes, and then you repeat on the 12th notes. Um, so within 12, given that there are millions of melodies and millions of tunes and millions of harmonic structures, there's going to be some overlap. There has to be. An example is, uh, if you hear this, my colleague in the music department pointed this out to me. If you heard. You probably think Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, right? But if I go. You could sing What a Wonderful World. And, and those two tunes are based on the same uh, sort of pitch structure. So there's going to be coincidence. One other quick example is Sibelius's Fifth Symphony starts. That's how it starts. Thelonious Monk's Round Midnight starts. So the shape is very much the same with a slight inflection, modal inflection. I mean, you know. If one wanted to look hard enough, you probably could find a doppelganger for almost any tune. I'm, I'm fascinated when jazz artists quote from within the genre of jazz, and they'll quote each other. Um, but sometimes the jazz artist chooses 
piece that's very familiar and he or she will expand upon that piece. A, a famous well-known tune is I'm in the mood for love. Okay, so what I did was I played the normal melody, the upper line on top of it, but basically in terms of background, this is what's going on. And then this is, that's the accompaniment. That's the left hand part. Um, there's a great artist named James Moody who heard that tune and said, instead of even starting with the melody, I'm in the mood for love, he would do it this way, and, and it, it would surprise me if you don't recognize this right away. Pretty baby, you are the soul that steps my control. Such a funny thing, but every time you hear me, I never can be there. You give me a smile and That's the first chorus of the tune. The the chords have been altered a little bit, but he consciously was using the background chords from I'm in the mood for love, and he's reconstructed what went on on top. Okay, that sounds legitimate. It sounds like a new thing. Now, what people don't listen for is that this takes place in the middle of that solo. Listen. Am I insane or do I really see heaven in You heard that, right? Now, this is a piece called Country Dances by Percy Granger that was written in the 19, I think he got it all arranged in 1918. Um, okay, just so you'll hear it again. This is where the interesting part Dun dee da dun dun da de a da dun da da de. And then if you hear, you know. Am I insane or do I really see heaven in? Okay, so this is James Moody very consciously kind of grabbing a moment. This is a spontaneous moment in African American musical practice. It is very normal to sort of be aware of yourself in history and aware of what, what measures of command you have of your voice, of your instrument. So it's a way of what Henry Louis Gates calls signifying. It shows the, you know, that I can work this into a tune that wouldn't have had it otherwise. So within jazz, this is kind of an ideal to be able to grab something out of nowhere. This is, and that's quite a few notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. It's like 11 notes worth of quotation. Is that substantial similarity? I don't know, you tell me. And there are uh, compositions that uh, involve uh, the, the concept of variation or transformation. It uses a certain theme and then it expands upon it. That is the entire jazz tradition. Now in classical music, it's a premeditated moment. You, you, you either ask someone, can I, can I uh, use your piece and write variations on it? or you grab a piece that's before the public, before the copyright um, laws came into effect, and you use that as a as a theme for variation. Why would I do it? That's what Jennifer told me to explain. Why would I quote? You know, um, I did it because I was interested in a particular technique within a lot of works, and um, that technique is a break. That means that the music suddenly stops and something happens in the space in between. And um, as I was writing my orchestra piece, which is full of breaks, I thought about, well, who's got some great breaks? And it, uh, Michael Jackson, okay? He's got some great breaks. recognizes don't stop till you get enough and I'm using that rhythm even in the um, 
difference is I decided, well, at the risk of, of showing up in court and having to deal with this, I have to transform it. And I interspersed a few of my own ideas and also turned the contour upside down. Became Is it legal? I don't know. Is it, is it familiar? Yes, intentionally so, because I wanted people to connect breaks with my piece, with Michael Jackson's breaks. As someone who maybe borrowed one day or someone who has done the borrowing, I think um, intention and purpose is a big deal to the, to the artist. Um, if it's intended, intended for mass commercial purpose, it, it would really be to someone's advantage to get in contact with the artist if possible. If, on the other hand, it is intended for educational or for local demonstrative or exploratory artistic purpose, I don't think um, artists get as riled up about that. And I don't think that that discussion takes place as much. Um, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but the, the question of, of where the artists themselves are coming from as people who would be borrowed. Sure, when someone's piece you know, suddenly is a commercial success and they've used something small in some way, um, that does kind of sting a little bit, I'm sure. But when it comes down to it, um, uh, we all have to see music. It's, there's, there's nothing we come up with that's new, that's brand new. I mean, that's really broadly philosophical, but that's where I, that is where I and many, many other musicians who, who create what we call new music, that's where we stand. What I'd like to do now and where I'm going to end up is I want to kind of go through, uh, I guess, four periods of time and just give you some examples and, and see how they fit in terms of music and copyright law. Uh, the first point in time is all the works created pre-1831 in the United States. Uh, uh, in some ways, uh, this also includes the uh, classical, Baroque, uh, and, and Romantic eras in uh, European music. And uh, as Anthony was, was mentioning, there's a whole lot of examples. Uh, Anthony mentioned uh, Bach taking the uh, Vivaldi Concerto for four and B minor and incorporated into his concerto for uh, a harpsichord. Mozart took, takes the finale of the Jupiter uh, Symphony from Haydn's 13th Symphony in D major. Mahler borrows Brahms' first symphony, which in turn uh, Brahms had borrowed from Beethoven's ninth. Uh, Handel was all over the place everywhere, borrowing from mm. ma many and multiple different sources. In fact, he was notorious about it. Uh, in some ways, uh, one might look at the transitional economic uh, uh, period of, uh, of, of early industrial Europe, and in some ways it was a transition into the modern capitalist economy, and patronage was still in uh, a form of supporting arts uh, in the uh, late 18th and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the 18th and early 19th century. In some ways, the uh, Beethovens, Mozarts, and Bachs did not have to go to the marketplace to recoup their investment in writing their um, their, 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 their works, and in some ways, it didn't become an issue that uh, I'm Beethoven is suing, or Beethoven sues the estate of Beethoven sues uh, the estate of Brahms for royalties for the incorporation from Beethoven's Ninth. Uh, in, in some ways, an alien idea. And Jamie Boyle has talked about the kind of odd way that we use uh, Shakespeare as the kind of paradigm of authorship when, in fact, Shakespeare was writing almost a century before the first copyright statute was invoked. And in some ways, these great geniuses, uh, while they were geniuses and extremely original, were also very much uh, 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 into borrowing or borrowing or influence. Uh, the second period of time I'd like to just mention is the um, a period from uh, uh, 1831 to 1909. And here we're talking about the kind of uh, crystallization of legal protection for notated musical scores. What's that leave out of the picture? Well, in some ways, the pre-Civil War United States was a, a country riven by racial divisions and primarily slavery. Uh, and in terms of uh, creating a dual economy or the kind of apartheid of music, uh, the notated uh, written out scores were generally going to be written by upper, upper middle class educated white people and in some ways devaluing, say, the folk 
a collective, sometimes anonymous and communal and inter intertemporal and intergenerational contributions of things like slavery or ultimately by the uh, late 19th and early 20th century, a tradition uh, like the blues, or for that matter, uh, 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 Appalachian folk music. So in, in some ways, it was a, an apartheid of music. There were certain kinds of music that would get, get protection, certain kinds of music that in some ways would not get protection. However, not getting protection is not as perhaps is not as big a tragedy as it might seem at first blush, at least in this rather truncated account. The lack of protection in some ways might have given rise to a lot of hybridization, a lot of cross-fertilization, a lot of incorporation of influences, and uh, in some ways bringing into being forms of music that otherwise would not have been created in a, in a very clearly delineated intellectual property landscape. And here in, uh, I'm talking of the birth of the blues uh, in terms of, uh, say, the, the Amongst some other factors, the uh, prevalence of uh, brass uh, instruments after the Civil War incorporated into marching bands, uh, and and in cities like New Orleans, say uh, many uh, freed slaves coming into possession of the, of these brass instruments. And here we're thinking of Louis Armstrong coming up with the syncopation that gave rise to the whole school or the birth or blossoming, uh, probably with with many other influences coming in as well. But they get, that literally gave birth to jazz uh, in in around the turn of the century. Uh, um, so in some ways, this 1909, uh, 1831 to 1909 uh, uh, lack of copyright protection was perhaps something that actually fueled of, of fecundity or invention. Uh, the third period is 1909 to 1976, and in some ways this is where the copyright color line is breached, uh, where works uh, that, that in some ways we're talking about that are subject to copyright were created from the 1920s on. Uh, what you see in, from 1909 to 1976 is a great deal of borrowing uh, once copyright in some ways extends to performances rather than just the notated text. Uh, the race color line is breached repeatedly, uh, 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 at first uh, haltingly and occasionally by adventurous musicians like Big Spider, Bicky, and many other uh, early swing um, uh, musicians, and ultimately unmasked by the 1950s with the appropriation of Big Mama Thornton and uh, uh, Elvis Presley's uh, Hound Dog. And, uh, I say whatever else went into rock and roll, uh, black music and blues music was was a large part of of it. And in some ways, the uh, the 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 appropriation was flowing one way, meaning out of say the communities that had initially produced it. Uh, although one might question this a little bit: uh, is it solely one way? Uh, one I think Willie Dixon, or rather Willie Dixon's widow, uh, or his daughter, is sitting around listening to Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love as Aoki sitting in his garage in the 1970s, trying his damnedest to figure out how the song goes. Uh, uh, Willie Dixon's uh, daughter hears A Whole Lot of Love, and she talks to a lawyer and says she wants to sue. She says, my dad wrote that, Willie Dixon in the 1930s. However, there's another song from around the same period called by Muddy Waters called Whole Lot of Love. Uh, uh, or, or, or you need love, which is another phrase from Whole Lot of Love. So in, in some ways, the, the, there was horizontal borrowing amongst these uh, uh, blues uh, musicians as well. Uh, Robert Johnson's Walking Blues, uh, uh, Muddy Waters Country Blues, uh, the form itself, the 12-bar blues, a 157 chord progression, in some ways the vehicle that everyone who plays rock and roll or blues, uh, or country music for that matter, is, is, is making some variation on. Where did that come from? Who owns that? In some ways, uh, the rhythms that came out of New Orleans uh, around the turn of the century uh, that gave rise to the 12-bar blues uh, owed a large debt to West African musicians and Caribbean musicians uh, in the uh, slave di diaspora. So uh, in some ways, this tradition would uh, continue uh, in terms of uh, prior to the civil rights movement. You might think that, say, the kind of uh, secret uh, countercultures of Coltrane and uh, Parker were in some ways uh, an attempt to kind of carry on the kind of blues tradition uh, uh, in a more modern day context uh, of taking songs like Bye Bye Blackbird, uh, My Favorite Things or How High the Moon, and in some ways dressed dramatically and radically transforming or recoding them. Finally, uh, I'll end up talking about 1976 to the present, which I guess I'd call the age of appropriation. Uh, why shouldn't I call it the age of strong copyright? Well, in some ways, uh, we have uh, appropriation is outlaws, and only outlaws will appropriate. Uh, and so it's copyright laws uh, expand in some ways more and more of the kind of things we do in, in our common lives, and I say particularly in musical lives, uh, uh, in, in some ways move from something that might be justifiably uh, seen as, uh, as, as within the, your rights as a consumer of, 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 of a piece of music into the kind of realm of you're appropriating something that belongs to someone else. Uh, and in some ways, the uh, uh, the digital technology, along with the invention of the ca cam 
particular video camera and the Xerox machine, but uh, the dig advance of digital technology and rise of digital networks in the 1990s definitely forced the issue. Uh, in terms of it dramatically increased the uh, incidents and, and possibilities where one is going to be appropriating and therefore uh, an infringer. Uh, so I guess in some ways where I want to close with is a quote from uh, Paul Goldstein, uh, who's a professor of law at Stanford University, he wrote a great book called Copyrights Highway that's in its second edition. He said, all of these decisions, and he's talking about the copyright decisions over the past 20 years, whether made in the courts, legislatures, or private law offices, have a single result. When copyright gives control to one person, it extracts some measure of freedom to imitate from everyone else. And I guess where, where I'd leave you in terms of uh, this is uh, a question, is when laws and customs diverge, uh, at least to my observation, uh, it's usually not uh, the, the customs that change. And here I'm talking about the, uh, the uh, practices of musicians from time immemorial to, in a sense, borrow and be influenced and to uh, use those influences to create new music. So thank you. And the current kind of technological challenges that everybody talks about, of course, are the peer-to-peer -peer challenge, which is another way to think of it as just pure distribution. That's the distributional challenge, the, what to do about verbatim copying and mass. And then sampling, the, the proliferation of tools that make it really easy to manipulate the actual sound recording. Um, so uh, the big two issues kind of everyone's talking about is distribution interaction. Um, so th those tend to get collapsed sort of into just copyright. The point I was trying to make here is that copyright is this pile of rights with a lot of different values embedded in it, growing from a lot of different experiences. To judge from most headlines, it's just copyright or not copyright. It's control or total anarchy. What Creative Commons is trying to do is essentially take this pile of rights, the, the, which people tend to kind of think of in the sea, in the black or white world, and then turn them into something much simpler, or at least translate them into um, what a little bit what Keith was referring to before about this split between customs and laws. Um, we're trying to use kind of everyday ways of describing what people, what, what rights people want to associate with their work and using licensing and contracts through voluntary means, um, let them do that. So these icons you see here are sort of license conditions people can pick. You come to our website, you have a song you want to put online and you say, I don't mind if people copy and distribute it, but the first one, just give me credit, just give me attribution. Um, the second one, just don't make any commercial uses of it. Um, the third one, don't make any derivative works out of this, leave it intact as a verbatim copy. Or the last one, which is share alike, which is if you do make some derivative work from my thing, if you adapt it or transform it, then you're obligated under this agreement to uh, share it with the world under the same terms. Um, so what we try to do is basically in the form of, you know, kind of hacking into copyright law using contract law, um, build these kind of cultural values that are sort of everyday ways you hear artists speak about how they want their work to be protected and build them into these, these kind of copyright licenses. Um, we're trying to make it even simpler still in the, in the music area, and we've just put out a, a license that's just called simply the music sharing license. And what it does is, um, as the name sort of implies, it basically says, my work's free to put on a file sharing network. Just don't change it, don't commercialize it, but download it for free, whatever you want. And then um, maybe more relevant to this conversation is a license we have out called the sampling license, which is an idea we got directly from, from Negative Land and Mark Hostler. And at the same time, from um, Gilberto Gil, who's the Minister of Culture in, in Brazil, not a license we offered originally. And what it is is basically a derivatives license. It says, um, you are not allowed to make commercial verbatim copies of my work. That's piracy. Whatever else the MPAA or the RIAA says, that's piracy. What's not piracy, and what we encourage you to do, is transform this work. And in fact, we'll, we'll encourage you so much to do so that we'll let you make any kind of commercial use you want from transforming my work. You can sample it. You can mash it up. You can do whatever you want with it. And it's not a combination of kind of factors we had thought of until I talked to Mark one time in Seattle at another conference. Um, so that's been an interesting process, putting that together. What exactly, how do you legally define what sampling is going to be? It's, re it's, it's one thing to say where the law it doesn't quite work in uh, appropriationist art. It's another thing to try and turn it around and try and figure out, well, God, OK, now we get to play copyright czar. What exactly are the guidelines going to be? And Mark and I and other members of Negative Land spent three or four months on a public email list trying to figure out exactly what this was going to be. Um, so we're also going to maybe combine these and kind of other kinds of licenses. So that's what the experience of doing this has been like. And then another issue is getting artists to adopt this. So Gilberto Gil 
was all over this from the beginning. It was, you know, partly his idea. But he, his, his label, Warner Brothers, caught wind of this. In the Wall Street Journal, they caught wind of this. Um, <laughs> and were not happy at all, because he didn't talk to them about it. So we're in this weird situation where the artist wants to do this, but he's got a particular deal with his label and his publisher. So we're running into this friction where, wait a minute, this is against the artist's wishes and you're not letting him do it. Um, so that's kind of the, the life of the, of the sampling license so far. Um, and I just did this slide up as people were talking. I think maybe as the conversation carries on, and I'm probably almost out of time here, um, it would be fun to uh, think about the sort of um, signifying or appropriation or remixing or interaction with music that Anthony was talking about at the composition level, at the abstract level of notes and rhythms and things like that, and think about how that works now in the age of digital sampling. Um, so that's like the negative land kind of signifying, as you'll hear about in a little bit, um, to think about how it works at the composition level and how it works at the recording level. All the stuff we do is, all the stuff Creative Commons offers, all the tools and things are free, and that we're a nonprofit, we're a 501c3. Um, just so you know, we're not, this isn't all a big ad to, for me to go make a buck afterwards. Um, but I'm available to make a buck, too, if you want to. Um, uh, and the other thing is just a point to kind of frame where we come at this from. Um, you'll hear from Mark uh, from Negative Land a little bit, and that they're sort of in the activist, almost sort of civil disobedience level, I think it's fair to say, um, in all this debate. Um, then we've heard from different kind of policymakers about how the law could change. Creative Commons is pretty much just a kind of a voluntary approach to all this stuff. It's about people who, at least, at the very least, people who want to share this stuff should be able to do it in a really easy way. Um, we don't pretend to be the overall solution to all this stuff at all. It's just kind of one tool among many. And I think our greatest ambition in the long term is to not just be a voluntary kind of organization where people can share if they want to, but in the grand scheme of things, influence how people think about copyright and maybe help crystallize some of those kind of norms or customs about how people think about creativity and maybe someday they'll seep into the laws. So that's, that's it. And thanks a lot, a ton, for having me here. This is an amazing conference. So. Are you concerned maybe, is it possible maybe that over time the, avail the, the Creative Commons license would become an excuse for, for uh, creating even harsher intellectual property laws? Like, you know, you could, I could certainly envision situations where the RAA, the MPA, is going, look, if the artist wants to make it free, they can release under the under the Creative Commons license. But you know, since they didn't say that, or yeah. rely on the copyright, and who cares what the artist says? Uh, you know, therefore, we should have ultra restrictive copyright laws because that you know the, the Creative Commons license or something like it becomes sort of the vehicle of free uh, of fair use. Yeah, I think that's a real danger. I think that again, we're not there yet, but. Um, uh, I hadn't heard that actually articulated by someone other than us within the organization hypothetically worrying about things until a couple weeks ago when um, a Professor Murgis of Berkeley was over at Stanford giving a talk and the, the thesis of this new paper he has was that um, the stronger intellectual property rights get, the more vibrant uh, the voluntary public domain community gets and the better the whole market gets based on some theory of like the law of conservation of bad laws or something. I don't know what. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just alarming. I'm sitting there in the audience and he says, well, of course, so, so what? So fair use can be pulled back some because you've got these great creative common substitutes. So it was just, just horrifying to hear. So I had to speak up. But I, that's, that's pretty powerful rhetoric, I think, from their side. And I think it's a, definitely a danger. What we try and do to clarify that is that voluntary fair use is an oxymoron, first of all. Right? Fair use is about being able to do something regardless of whether or not the copyright holder says you can especially in cases of parody or um, uh, criticism. Um, but we try and make really clear, maybe we don't do a good enough job about it, that we're trying to go above and beyond fair use, well above and beyond fair use, um, and that uh, the licenses don't affect anything like that. Now, I think that's potentially a real danger, but it's still a little ways away. I don't know if y'all want to I'd like to respond, uh, Whitney. Uh, in, in some ways, how much harsher can they get? <laughs> when are they going to take you out and shoot you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but but, but uh, on, on a slightly more constructive note, I was going to say that in, in some ways, uh, <laughs> the U.S. copyright laws, uh, I, I think as well as, as, as the inter international copyright regime we seem to be moving towards, seems to be hooked on an exceptions approach, meaning where they create this really strong right and then they try to articulate either legislatively or judicially some kinds of uh, exceptions to it. And in some ways, at least... If, if, if and when there comes a time when copyright laws are going to be opened up to reform, one might think you want to try to do a field ground reversal on that in some ways saying, okay, here are the rights we want to guarantee to the public, and then in some ways, and then we're going to strike a balance with the rights we're going to give to the, 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 the creators rather than, in a sense, let's create this like 
uh, a metallic hydrogen kind of like a uh, super strong copyright and then, and then try to create one or two exceptions to it. But, but I'd say that, that that's more just for the future. Our work is inspired by what we find. We actually don't set out to, to uh, go after targets or anything. We really stumble across stuff and we get excited by it and we want to make things out of it. And our work's always really been a hybrid of, of things that we, we find, we appropriate, uh, uh, we steal, whatever word you want to use, and things that we've made ourselves and mixed together. Um, it was only, it was in 1991 that uh, we finally uh, stepped on the wrong big toe. And uh, we had gotten a hold of a recording of a top 40 disc jockey named Casey Kasem. And how many of you know who he is? OK. I'm realizing as the years go by, and Casey's kind of slowly going off the map, that this story is going to mean less and less to people who are under the age of, I don't know, 25. But um, Casey Kasem is also the voice of Sk Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. <laughs> That's him. And um, he's also an interesting figure. He's an animal rights activist. He was arrested for um, protesting uh, a nuclear testing. And he's he's uh, was one of the few Hollywood celebrities in 91 that came out against the first invasion of Iraq. But Casey Kasem was uh, doing um, his voiceover uh, takes in the studio for his radio show. And when you do this, you do a lot of different uh, takes over and over to try to get the best ones. And uh, something was going wrong that day. I don't know what. But Casey just goes ballistic in the studio, totally apeshit, uh, and uh, is incredibly harsh and cruel and nasty to the engineer who's uh, uh, recording him. And these tapes we got a hold of. Someone gave these to us at, uh, after a show we did in Portland, Oregon. And of course, nowadays, if these tapes surfaced, they would be all over the, the, the web. Everyone would be downloading them. And we never would have made this record, because part of what also inspired us was we were the only people who had them, just about the only. You know, It was a special find, some secret thing that we've got. So these tapes were so funny. We said, wow, we've got to do something with this material. This is great. What can we make out of this? Well, he happened to be introducing a new song by a band called U2. And we thought, huh, well, maybe we should have him. What would make sense? He should be talking over a little bit of music from you, too, and then have it kind of break down and dissolve into this other, you know, him messing up and, and uh, having a bad day. And, and the whole project kind of grew from there. Um, and it's for reasons which I don't quite understand. We, we, we were always creating things where we, wish we, we weren't worrying about other things that other people might realistically say. Oh, geez, you're nuts. Why are you doing that? But for us, these just seem like really good ideas. And to the, the degree to which we sensed that maybe we're doing something you kind of sort of shouldn't do, that just made it more interesting. That there's something I think I said uh, when I was here a few years ago, that there are always those artists who like to work within a tradition and expand upon that. And there are those artists, I think they're a smaller number, but they're drawn like moths to a flame. You know, they're drawn toward wanting to do things that they feel like they're kind of not supposed to do, you know, pushing at the edges of stuff. And that's precisely the area where they get the most creative spark. They're the most excited, they get the most energy. And, and or in, in our case, we think it's the funniest, too. So, um, we, um, what else did we do in this project? We uh, did everything that, everything bad. So si it's ended up turning into a single. Side one was a cover version of the U2 song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. We had a sort of dramatic reading of the lyrics uh, by a member of the group, uh, David, also known as the weatherman, who kind of butchered Bono's lyrics and altered them. Now, when you do a cover version of a song, you don't have to get permission, but if you alter the lyrics, you got to get permission. So we did that. We used a very 30-second chunk of the U2 song as the uh, beginning intro. Uh, of course, didn't clear that. There's uh, bad words in this, and that was, uh, they didn't like that either. But the, the final thing that really brought it to the attention of Island Records that really made them decide to nail our asses was that we, we ended up uh, making the, the record look like this. And um, we thought, this, is, this would be funny. Uh, it's, it's confusing. It looks like a, a new album from U2 that's called Negative Man. 
and and we like the idea that you put this in a record store and people are confused. We like the idea of creating this this at the moment of consumption. Uh, you're 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 not quite sure what's going on here. And Negative Land's always been interested in, in creating that, that that kind of moment of what the, what what is this? Or they can't do that, but they are. How is this possible? And we've been able to do that a few different times in our, our career, and it, it's it's very thrilling to get to do. We, were, we also assume people would figure it out, but never underestimate uh, the inattentiveness of the average American. <laughs> because it turned out that places like Tower Records was putting up entire window displays of this record when it came out, um, <laughs> thinking it was the new U2 album. Uh, very funny. So, um, uh, we also, of course, were referencing that U2 stole their name as well. This is a U2 spy plane on the cover, uh, famously shot down in 1960, uh, the pilot Powers board. And um, so this thing came out, and within 10 days, we uh, were hit with a 200-page lawsuit. Uh, we were also on a record label at the time called SST Records, so both Negative Land and SST were sued. They sued us for, they sued us for, of course, copyright infringement, trademark infringement. Uh, fraud, you know, deceiving YouTube fans into buying our record as a money making, that it, it was a big money making scheme. Uh, for defamation of character, for associating this foul language with the clean cut image of the band U2. For failure to obtain, you know, proper licenses when you're doing a cover. Kind of language, but we didn't, you know, get permission to alter the lyrics and do that. So they did what good lawyers do you just throw everything you can. It's a pretty funny piece of work to end up causing so much trouble. Um, but it, it politicized us intensely so, and it also made us realize that we needed to, uh, when, we, when we went on to do subsequent work, you know, we had to think. I mean, it had a chilling effect for maybe about three months. But we had to really make the conscious decision, you know, we're going to keep doing this. And unfortunately, we, we put out a, well, not unfortunately, but we put out a magazine that documented the case, and then the label we had been on at the time, SST, turned around and sued us for putting out a magazine that was about being sued. So it got very, very ugly and convoluted. But um, we have not, in fact, been sued since then. We have had some threats against us, but we have stood our ground and people backed down. And from what I understand, we, we did so terribly embarrass everybody at Island Records and U2 and Casey Kasem and everybody looked so dumb for going after us uh, that, that, the, that the, the mainstream music industry seems to have taken an attitude of, oh, we know who those guys are, just leave them alone, you know. And that was one of my goals, really, was I hope we can, write, we can raise these issues and do the good deed here, but also I just hope for ourselves we can at least get these people to leave us the hell alone because we want to keep doing this work and we don't think this threatens anybody. You know, what, what's the problem? And so since then, we continue to occasionally deal with these issues very directly, but a lot of our work continues to be inspired by found things, uh, continues to appropriate, and I hope, you know, sets an example of that this is nothing to be afraid of, it's not a big deal, and, and it's really shifting, and as Anthony was kind of mentioning earlier, you know, that computer's the ultimate collage box, that this notion of that cut and paste and collage is just becoming more and more of kind of just it's something people do. It's a tool, it's an approach, and... Uh, we ain't, we ain't cutting edge anymore at all. We're not. Uh, there's two main effects that I, that I see when it comes to how the law impacts creativity right now. One is very clearly it changes the art that gets made. Uh, and the second is that it very clearly makes the artist poorer, not just the artist who, uh, who did the sampling maybe, but actually the whole pool of, of uh, artistic money and how that gets split up. A lot of it doesn't get back to the artist at that point. I'll get into that a little bit later, but I want to talk about how it changes things first. Um, there's there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, something I call it the fair use precipice which is this concept that if, uh, if you use something and you think it's fair use, if it is fair use, if you have to go to court and you find out that it is fair use, you don't have to pay anything to anybody except, of course, the lawyers who defended you. Um, if it's not fair use, suddenly you're, you're there and you can get statutory damages against you, you could lose all your profits, you can, you know, there's very draconian remedies that could be invoked. 
But when you think about it from a, uh, and you step back for a second and think like, well, wait a second, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, if, if fair use is a, is a five out of 10 or something, we're talking about going to 5.1, 5.2, and that creates these draconian remedies uh, that can wipe people out. And that's, that's, it almost abrogates the concept of fair use because nobody would ever do that. Nobody, you know, no commercial interest is ever going to be out there going like, well, I think we can just skirt by on this one. Uh, like when the, when Bismarcky got sued, uh, Warner Brothers had a, a uh, when they, when they lost with the thou shalt not steal case, um, Warner Brothers after that had this whole process of review by a, there was a board that would review like all the records to make sure that there was, you know, all the samples on there were cleared. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't even mix the record until all the samples were cleared. Um, so it really affected what happened, you know, in that company afterwards and really affected the industry as a whole. What we see now a lot is that, um, you know, people like to, to sample because it's a good thing. What happens is it, it, it's fun for them. It's, it's a different way of doing things. It's, it's uh, you know, you can do it that way. You can do it a lot of other ways. You can make music any, any way you want. It's just one way to do it. And certainly when you're in the underground, they tend to use a lot of samples. And, you know, I mean, like the Grey album or something like that, where it's, where it's really, you know, uh, the clearances would be absolutely prohibitive. So what happens a lot is that it floats around on the underground, and then if it gets picked up by a major, they go through this process of clearing the record as much as they can and removing the samples that, uh, that they couldn't clear or that would be prohibitively expensive. Um, sometimes those records get out and get big first, and then you do the clearances afterwards. And uh, that happened, for instance, with the Fugees. They, um, they released a wonderful record that uh, had a lot of uncleared samples, and there was you know, litigation and, and, and uh, you know, settlements going on for years and years afterwards. So you see a lot of that from the, the transition from underground to mainstream and the uh, first record, second record kind of concept, where you know, the sampling just gets pushed under the, uh, under the rug, and it doesn't really happen anymore. Um, it also limits sometimes, not, not just uh, hip hop, but uh, a great example is uh, Warren Haynes and Government Mule. Warren being a North Carolina guy, they do an amazing version uh, of the Who song, Young Man. But they only do it live because the way that, they, uh, that they've arranged it is that the entire song is arranged from Led, with Led Zeppelin uh, guitar parts. So it would be like, you know, some bits from In My Time of Dying or A Whole Lot of Love and all that kind of stuff, all sort of cut and pasted uh, to make a new version of Young Man, but the lyrics are still Young Man. And so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's nothing that they can ever record. It will never be recorded because you can't go and get all those licenses from, uh, from the publishers who represent the Led Zeppelin catalog. It wouldn't really work out that way. Even if it did, it wouldn't be worth it because uh, Warren's a great songwriter. He's written the number one country hit ever, the, uh, the Garth Brooks song. Uh, he doesn't really need to do that stuff. This is just something he's doing to have fun, which leads me to the second concept that I want to talk about, about how the clearance process really makes the artistic community as a whole that much more poorer. When you think about it for a second, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the, the rationale and the justification for obtaining clearances is, is, that, you know, is that it's felt that the original artist should get something too. You know, if you sample James Brown, he should get something, which on its face, I think, is, is uh, you know, not a horrible position at all. It, it kind of makes some sense, uh, and, I, and I don't begrudge people for holding it. But what the reality is, is that it doesn't really work like that. I mean, I suspect that one of the reasons why James Brown isn't licensing stuff is because he's probably unrecouped at the record company. He doesn't get anything. So he's like, well, if I could get the money, it might be a different thing. It might be a different answer. But if I'm not going to get the money, then why should I? Uh, it's important to understand how the licensing income is split between an artist and a record company. Let's stick with James Brown just for, for the sake of, uh, of ease. If you want to license something that incorporates James Brown in it, you have to go to, um, what is it, he's on Universal, or he, he was, his catalog has been bought by Universal. Um, when they license something, one of his masters for a use, the typical split is 50-50 between the artist and the record company. So if you pay, if artist A pays $100 to clear, um, to clear that sample, it's not that $100 goes to James Brown and now that you know, he's paid the tithe and, and you know, somehow that's a zero-sum game and everything's been, everyone's been made whole. What actually happens is that $50 goes straight to Universal, 
and $50 might get to James Brown if he's recouped, uh, but he usually isn't. Uh, for those of you who don't know the way record contracts work very well, uh, most of the costs incurred in making the record, well, all the costs incurred in making the record and most of the costs that are incurred in uh, marketing the record are typically recoupable solely from the artist's money, which the effect is is that they very rarely collect royalties for their, uh, for their records. It's, uh, they usually stay perpetually unrecouped especially with these catalog artists where, where you know, um, they haven't had, you know, big, big, big hits or uh, there's just, you know, the, the, um, the account stays on recoup for years and years and years. So what happens is that out of that $100, uh, you know, Universal definitely gets 50 of it and they probably get the second 50. And if that was it, that wouldn't be the end of the world. Well, I guess it would be the end of the world. But if that was it, it, it actually gets worse because now the the artist A still has to pay the clearance fees. They have to, I mean, not the clearance, the license fees, but the, the cost to get it cleared. Whether it's their lawyer that's clearing it or whether there's a specialized sample clearance house uh, that's doing that, you know, that, that could cost thousands of dollars just itself, having someone deal with the, with the transaction. So what happens is out of that $100 uh, that, that was originally going to be in the artist A's pocket, chances are that maybe none of it is in any artist's pocket anymore, uh, plus the clearance fees. Maybe call that another $15. So you have like now $115 has disappeared from the artist compensation pool. And, uh, you know, it's really not compensating much of anybody. One of the, one of the common things that we see in, in these types of debates, um, and we saw it really actually with, with Glenn in the Creative Commons, is talking about what the artists want. And I'm not always so sure that that's a great place to be talking. That's a, that's, that, that's a very productive thing to think about, at least not overly so. Because the problem is, is that there is no artistic viewpoint, you know, so to speak. Artists, artists thoughts about things are all over the map, you know. And, uh, you know, where Mark is an artist who samples and gets sampled, and he has his feelings about that, you know. Warren Haynes might have a completely different viewpoint about that, and Wyclef has a different viewpoint about that, you know. And it's, there is no real single artistic viewpoint. It's easier to say that the, you know, the major record labels have a, a similar viewpoint, because they really do, and they usually often act in concert. Um, but artists are thinking about a lot of different things, and they can, be, you know, they can be some of the most zealot copyright maximalists out there, no doubt. Uh, some of them are, feel that they own everything. I mean, a couple of uh, suits that I had seen, I don't do litigation, but uh, we, you know, we, we, it impacts some of what we do. Uh, for instance, when um, MC Hammer had that song, I forget what it was called, it was the one just before You Can't Touch This, where basically it was, oh, it was Here Comes the Hammer. It was like, uh-oh, 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 here comes the hammer. And I shit you not, he got sued because someone said they owned uh-oh. <laughs> and it didn't just go away. It didn't, you know, it was, it dragged on for a long time. It's, it's interesting to see the different approaches and what artists think about things. And, I, and I'm not even sure that, it, see, I, the point is I don't think that we should even be necessarily thinking about what artists want. We should I, think. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, we should be thinking about what's best. What's, you know, what's, what's the best rules to have. Because, um, I mean, I think it's, it's great that there is a way for, uh, for artists to say, okay, you know, this is what I'm allowing in excess of the, I mean, uh, this is what I'm allowing, despite the fact that I can prohibit it lawfully. But uh, you know, I could also see on the other side, if you you know, if you were taking this from a different viewpoint, say uh, you were working with the, with the major labels or something like that, and they would say, well, okay, well, we'll do these click rack licenses on our uh, on our records that will say that you can't do anything at all now, you know, right. with with anything, you, you know. In fact, you have to send me another dollar every time you listen to it. Um, you know, there's I don't think that there's any uh, there's no end to what you would see if you had everyone, you know, if people, if you had copyright owners or artists writing their own laws. I mean, I actually think that if, that if, uh, if we took the current environment of intellectual property and brought it back to the 20s and 30s, that jazz and blues would be crushed. Because, you know, uh, you, you can listen, I mean, you know, blues is like, you were talking about that, about the horizontal spreading of all this different stuff, and even people that say that they wrote this song, well, yeah, that was based on this other song over here, or people, you know, they heard the song once when they were a kid, and they can't really remember the words, so they 
fill it in as best they can, and then they call it theirs. Um, I think that, I mean, what, what's happening in jazz and blues really isn't any different than what happens to sampling. It's just that with sampling, you have sort of this trail now, this very obvious copying. Uh, and it makes it, it makes it seem that that's, you know, that's somehow wrong because it's easy. But it's the same thing that, you know, I mean, every time something gets easier, people say it's wrong. Uh, when saxophones first came out, I think they were considered bad instruments because they were easier to play than the other instruments that you could play at the time. And the same with rock, with, uh, with electric guitars. They were considered bad because they were so easy to play. You know, the, the fact that art is easy to do doesn't make it bad in my mind. It just means that, you know, the, raises the bar a little bit. You have to make more interesting art. <laughs>